All right, you see, our title today, our topic today is entitled, can you read it? The Witch of <laughs> a place called Endor. I don't know where that is. Well, before we begin, I would like to begin with an amazing story or an amazing fact. You know, on the weekend of March 22nd and 23rd, Saturday and Sunday, 1997, 39 members of a cult called Heaven's Gate joined in mass suicide. This is the largest in American history. They believed that through death, they would go to a higher level of existence. James Tabo, a cult expert at the University of North Carolina, said, this about Heaven's Gate cult. He said, this group is completely different. Uh -huh. These people rather calmly followed suicide as they exit in a very positive way to a higher level of existence. A higher level of existence. You see, for the Heaven's Gate, they defined death not as an enemy of life itself, but they said it's a higher gate of existence. But the question is, is death life or death is death? What happens when people die? Do they go to heaven? It's a big confusion. Do they go down in hell? Or they go somewhere in purgatory? I was told that, that they go to purgatory where you are caned a little if your sins were not many, and then they will transpose you to heaven. Or where do they go? No. Or they reincarnate, they become into other forms of animals. Many religions have many beliefs about death. Let's ask, why did they commit suicide? And many people have opened the devil's door by not understanding what happens when you die. I'm going to give you something away from the historical an appreciation to the significance of this topic, how to identify a cult. Oh, you didn't see that coming. How to identify a... I'm going to give you four ways of identifying a cult. How do they open the devil's door? From the Christian perspective, what's a cult? Let's define it. Number one, the definition. A cult is any group that does not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and they don't accept the Bible as the foundation of their faith. That's what a cult is. Did you hear what a cult is? Two things. They don't accept who? Jesus. Number two, they don't accept the Bible. Whenever you enter a church who, which accepts Jesus and the entire Bible, that church is not a cult. But a cult is some, a group that does not accept Jesus, not the Bible. Here are four ways of identifying a cult. Number one, a cult follows human leader. When you see people following a person, a church just following a person, rather than following Jesus, that's what the Heaven's Gate did. They were following Marshall Applewhite. That was his name. They were following a former choir director. It's not safe, friends, to follow men. It is only safe to follow Jesus. He said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by. If you want to go the safe way, follow Jesus. He said, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he, that is Jesus, goeth forth, and the sheep follow him. Finish the sentence. For they know his voice. It is safe to follow Jesus. It's not safe to follow a man. Don't even follow me, even if I answer all your questions correctly. I am a man and I make mistakes. Don't even follow your pastor. Well, I'm not saying it's wrong to consult your pastor, but don't follow them. Follow Jesus. That's why Jesus said in John 10 verse 4 that my sheep know my voice. Question, who are you following? Who are you following? A human leader or Jesus? A cult follows a human leader rather than Jesus. Well, friends, this means that if you discover anything that Jesus says and it is in the Bible, you need to follow it. Don't avoid following something in the Bible because your pastor follows something different. They could be misled. It's okay to follow Jesus. It's not okay to follow a human leader. Other people say, yes, I know what the Bible says, but I'm going to ask my pastor. It's okay to ask your pastor, but don't follow your pastor. 
check what the Bible says, and what if, the, if the, your pastor is saying what the Bible is not saying, then follow Jesus, don't follow the pastor. Number two, do you want to know how to identify a, a cult? Huh? Oh, I can jump this part if you don't want to know. You, do you want to know how to identify a cult? All right, number two, cults follow human teachings rather than the Bible. That's an important point. Christians should follow Jesus, the living word, and the Bible, the written word. In John 17, 17, it says, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. What we need to follow is the word of God. It is the lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Why do we need a light to our path? Because today is, today's world is darkened by cultish worship and you'll see it all over. They burn schools of innocent children and you see they lead astray. Some go and even kill themselves. So cults follow. You know, here is actually this classroom, a photograph of the classroom of the Heaven's Gate cult. You know, there were 38 followers that Marshall Applewhite would sit them down on those chairs and then he would teach them. When you look up there, you'll see some two seats. Can you see two seats? They say that Applewhite would sit on one of the seats and the next seat would be left for a ghost of the deceased girlfriend or the dead girlfriend. Marshall Applewhite was his name. He left his wife and ran off with another woman and together they started this Heaven's Gate uh, cult. So they would sit, he would sit here and his ghost, the ghost of his dead girlfriend would come and you know, in every other time this dead girlfriend would assist him in teaching. I wish if you were there you would have sat to listen to his dead girlfriend. That sounds crazy, isn't it? A ghost teaching. Eh? Please be sure I'm not a ghost. Eh? <laughs> Neither is my wife a ghost. We are real people, real flesh and blood. So number two, cults follow what? You know, there are many Christians who are making the same mistakes. They are not following Jesus. They are following the human teachings. They are not following, you know, uh, the Bible. They are just following many, many other teachings out there, and there are many. Church members, they know the truths from the Bible, but they are unwilling to follow. Many Christians know that the Ten Commandments, in fact, I need to ask my question of yesterday, how many commandments are in the Ten Commandments? Many Christians know that there are Ten Commandments in the Ten Commandments, but they follow their pastors and human leaders to keep only nine. They are unwilling to keep all of them. That might lead you to a cult. Cults follow human teachings rather than the Bible. Let's move on to number three. A cult urge group conformity. Group conformity. That means be like everyone else. Don't be different. Again, the Heaven's Gate cult is a good example as we are studying this evening. Before committing suicide... They prepared a video outlining their deadly plans. And you could watch that video on, the, on YouTube. You know, just after their death, the, the people who watched that video said all of them looked alike. They shaved their hairs. You couldn't tell. They dressed the same. You couldn't tell who was a man, who was a woman. Carl's urge group conformity. And there are Christians who are making the same mistake, wearing same length of clothes, same type of, you know, of embroidery. That may be not true. Each of us has individuality that we need to express even in life. God gives us freedom of choice. There are some people who look nice in short hair. Others don't. Yes, and God respects our individuality. Some people look nice in a coat. Others wear the coat and the coat tells them, no, 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 you need to get out of here because the coat wears them. Cults urge this idea of group conformity. And the people reason like this out here, if everyone else is doing it, it must be right. It's not true, friends. Majority, when it comes to truth, the majority are not always right. It's called peer pressure. Yeah? Mind control. That's what they do. So you need to look like, be like, do like. 
but God gives us a freedom of choice. Back in the plain of Dora, some three young men, you know that story from Daniel chapter 3, they dared to stand. They refused to bow down to the idol, even when threatened to death. The majority bowed, but they said, we will not bow, we will not And they also didn't burn. You know, they would have pretended to be tying their shoelaces. Some people are not following. They are just pretending to tie their shoelaces. This guy said, we are not even tying those shoelaces now. The king called them and they told the king, we are not careful how we will answer this matter. Our God is able to deliver us. That part you should say amen to. But the part I like is the one they added. Even if he doesn't deliver us, we will not bow down or we will not urge, we will not get into group conformity. Well, friends, for you to be a Christian, you must be able to stand straight. And they s Did you hear of Daniel the other day who was not eaten by lions? I like proposing that the reasons lions didn't eat Daniel, he had a lot of backbone. Today, a few people have backbone. I know you, you missed it, but I'm just going to jump from there. A few people, most of Christians are mambi pambi, fleshy, compromising, easy to bend Christians. When had a backbone, the lion couldn't eat him and he couldn't be eaten. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto men, but the end therefore is death. Back in the days of Noah, Noah was thought to be a cultish man. Well, the majority were wrong. There had never been rain. Never had it rained. They didn't know it would rain. But the safe place during those days, if you were obeying, if you were following Noah those days, they would call you, you are following a cult. But friends, the truth is not going to be popular. You cannot follow the truth and follow a crowd. So cults, that's why cults urge group conformity. Number four, I want you to take these notes and never forget this. Cults are deceived on the state of the dead. And the rest of this evening's lesson I'm going to spend telling you where, what happens to the dead. Cults are what? Deceived on the state of death. The New Age cults, you know, the Heaven's Gate were cheated that death is going to a higher level. Most New Age cults teach that there is no death, they teach that man is God and that knowledge of self is salvation. And that is why they are opening the heaven's door. Hear what James Tabo said about this um, heaven's gate. He said, the group is completely different. These people, they calmly followed suicide. My friend, suicide is suicide. And let me announce here for anybody tired of their life. You can postpone suicide, isn't it? But when you die, you can't postpone it. And if you kill yourself, you have committed a sin against one of the commandments. Which commandment is that? Thou shalt not kill, including yourself. And you have a case to reckon with God if you kill yourself, for any good reason. They said, it, it's a very positive way. In a very positive way, they existed to a higher level of existence. No, friends, that was deception. They were deceived about the state of man in death. When you die, they, you are really dead. Then they were cheated that when you die, you don't really die. And many of us, I think, are quoting that perspective. Cults are deceived about the state of death. Many Christians also believe that when you die, you go, I don't know, to purgatory, I don't know, to hell, and you stay there, you burn for eternity. Have you heard that? I wish you could turn the camera on, the, on this audience. Have you heard a teaching that says that when you die, or when you are uh, after life, and you are a sinful person, you are going to burn forever. Can I see your hands if you've had that teaching that this little finger will burn for a thousand years? Oh, quite a number. And how many of you have heard, just keep the camera on the audience, how many of you have heard that when you die, you go to heaven? Can I see? Many Christians think that that is what the Bible teach, and they are deceived. If you go to a place, a church, an organization that thinks that when you die, you go to heaven, we are going to see what the Bible has to say. Anyway, you go to some place, stars, I don't know, to some satellite, I don't know what they say. Whatever they are saying, it's not true. The question is, what happens when you die? Are the dead really dead? 
Have you, any of you has walked in a tomb? You know me, I believe the tomb is one of the safest places. Any of you can walk in a cemetery? Can I see? No, put up your hand, ya ukweli. Ah, we are going to see that there is nobody in the cemetery, actually. <laughs> Who are the voices that you hear from the tomb? I am going to answer. Are they friendly voices or they are dangerous voices? Who are the spirits of spiritualism? Those people who go to communicate with the dead. That might be the devil's door and many have opened it. Can it be dangerous to converse with the spirits of the dead? Let's go to our historical tonight. We get the story from the book of First Kings. Saul, a tall, dark, handsome young man, was the first king of the United Nation of Israel. Well, this king had a lot of power, being the first king. He had a lot of power. They say that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And he refused to follow God on certain things. You read that in 1 Samuel 15. Samuel told him, go and destroy the Amalekites. And he decided, no, 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 I need to bring some of this for sacrifice. And God rejected him because he didn't obey. And friends, I want to tell you, it is not safe to disobey God. When you can still hear the voice of God, you need to answer and obey. And they are, you know, God left him and he was tormented on many, many occasions. You know, that David would come to truth him because he was tormented with the spirits of the devils because he refused to obey God. And the question is, when you are distressed, whom do you turn to? Do you turn to God or do you turn to these guys? Saul, in his distress, well, he said, I can't get any help. So he wouldn't hear from Samuel who was long dead. He wouldn't hear from God, and he was distressed. And the Philistines were mounting great pressure on him. And he said, please, get me some help. He went out to a place called Endor, to a witch. And he told the witch, desperately wanting to listen to God, he told the witch, can you do some things that I can hear? Samuel and the witch told him well I am able to and he did all the things that the Nigerian movies keep showing you every other time and they have brainwashed our society today nobody today lives who doesn't believe in witchcraft that is their chief aim why do they return those who are dead on their move what are they subliminally sending to your subconscious for you to understand and grasp and keep, you know, uh, believing as you go along? That's what Saul encountered when he went to Endor. This witch did a few of his things on his calabash and poof, somebody came up. And let's see. The king asked the woman, what did you see or what sawest thou? And the woman said to Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Is that where gods are? Are gods ascending from the earth? Well, the, the, the guy came and the voice, you know, spoke from the form that showed up that looked and talked exactly like Samuel and gave a most foreboding prophecy, you know, a most discouraging message. Saul was told, tomorrow you go to battle, your sons will die. He told the truth and mixed it with error. And gave the discouraging message. And sure enough, the next day, King Saul and his sons were slain in a fierce battle with the Philistines. What a sad ending to someone who has stand on the wrong places when there is trouble in their life. And when he saw that he could not overcome, he watched when Jonathan, Jonathan his son, the battle waxed Saul, the Bible says, and Saul and the archers hit him. His army was hit. His son Jonathan died. Two of his sons was all, were also killed in the battle. And the Bible says when he saw that, he took a sword like Judas and put it on the ground and fell on it, committed suicide. And his armor bearer, when he saw that the guy he was always guarding also killed himself, fell on the sword. It's very dangerous when you are following and speaking with the dead. I'd like to tell you tonight, who are those spirits of the dead? And our lesson is quite a long. Let's move in along. I'm going to be quite fast. If you must take pictures of this slide, please do. I'm going to add extremely a lot of important information and, uh, aside from the historical. Question number one. What was the form that Saul saw 
sorry, was the form, yes, that's the question, was the form that Saul saw actually Samuel the prophet? Was that the prophet? Answer, First Kings 22, 22, that's a text you can remember. The Bible says, and he said, I will go forth and I will be a... Oh, those who are in this auditorium, you can call forth the answers, and those who are watching this thing later can also join to speak the answers. I will also be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophet. So are there spirits out there that lie? Yes, the Bible confirms, Revelation 16, 14, for they are spirits of the... The guys who usually call out these lessons today didn't come. So I think I'll just go along with myself. Would you please read the parts that are yellow? It's your part. We said when you hear, you understand certain. When you hear and you see, you understand some. When you hear, see, and you say, you understand most. When you hear, see, say, and write, you understand all. What we want you to do is to understand all. So when the answers come in yellow, please call them out. Do, question number two. Do the dead come back to converse with or haunt the living? Let's read what the Bible says. Job 14, 21. His sons, that the son of the dead, come to honor and he knoweth it not. They are brought low and he perceiveth it not. How much do the dead know? The next verse, 9 verse 5. Do they come back to speak? Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, this is the wisest man ever. He said, for the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. Obviously, if the dead lived immediately after death, then they would have a lot to say. They would have a lot of knowledge. They would have many, many things. Let's look at the next text. For the memory of them is forgotten, and their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. If they had something after death, then they would come and share their love. Giving you another text. It says, neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Well, let's read another one. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge. They have no knowledge. And I'm just adding you. These ones are not in the historicals. Now you can add this. Psalms 115 verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord. If they are in heaven. The, if I am dead and I arrive in heaven, friends, the first thing I'll do, because I know that is a big grace for me. I am not worthy of going to heaven. I'll be praising the Lord, isn't it? And some says the dead praise not the Lord. Why? They are not in heaven. I'll tell you where they are. In death, there is no remembrance of thee. They don't remember God, giving you more text. He shall return no more to his house. Don't tell me he came to tell me how to name my children. That may not be him. I'm going to tell you who he is in a short while. They don't return to his house. Death cannot celebrate thee. His thoughts perish. Write those texts. Well, friends, the Bible teaches us that the dead know nothing. They do not come back to visit the living and Jesus is the one who gives us hope in case we have our loved ones who died. Question number three, according to the book of Revelation, who has the keys for death? Uh-huh, answer. Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Because Jesus himself experienced death, he has the keys of death. And he can give us hope that whatever happened to our loved ones, whatever happens to us, we shall live again. But when shall we live again? We will see. It's, to, it's at the end when Jesus comes back if we die in this body. Question number four. How did God make man in the beginning? Why is that question important? Because death is the reverse of creation. So if we understand what happened at creation, we will understand what happens at... Today you decided you won't talk to me. It's fine, I will talk to myself. You will understand how did God make man? We find that in Genesis 2-7. It says, and the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground. And then he did something. He breathed into his nostrils the what? The breath of life. And then man was given a living soul. Is that what he says? No. He doesn't say man was given. Man became. What's the word? 
became a living soul. Check that your Bible verse says that. So what happened actually, notice that God did not put a living soul into the man. No, it was dust plus the breath, then that became. That is the result. The result became. The word is, can you tell your neighbor, man became. So look at your neighbor and what you are seeing next there. If they have breath of life in their nostrils, that is a living soul. Uh -huh. Did you hear that? That's very important. Question, where was Adam before he was made? Where, uh -uh. where was Adam before he was made? He was not there because the breath of life was with God and there was somewhere in Eden. How did Adam come into being? The dust of the earth and the breath of God. And then Adam became a living soul. Some people think that a soul is something that floats. We are going to see it's not true. Adam was not some disembodied soul floating around in the cosmos waiting for a body, for God to make the body and then a tokleze into the body. No, 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 no. The formation of dust plus breath. <sighs> then Adam, what's the word? Became, became, became. So now, what happened, that's now the next question, at death. Now we know how he came into being. What happened at death? Because death is the reverse of creation. We read Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. Uh -huh. Notice here, the word return. The dust returns and something else. What's that? Let, let's answer the question. What is it that came from God that caused Adam to have the living soul? It's called the breath, isn't it? That's why the second part of Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, And the spirit also does, does what? Shall return to God who gave it. And some people are thinking, eh, maybe that spirit is the soul. No, that spirit, the word spirit, which, what happens to the spirit? The spirit does what? Returns. What happens to the body at death? The body? There the are two words in this lecture. Number one, became. Number two, return. Please remember that. This word spirit, in Hebrew word, it is ruach. Can I teach you some little Hebrew? Can you say that word ruach? It's used 377 times in the Bible. 117 times it is translated to mean wind or air. 33 times it's, me, it's translated to mean breath. And 277 times, it, 227 times it's used to mean the spirit. And that is the one used in this Ecclesiastes. When the Bible says the spirit, it says the ruach returns to God. Question, is that a soul? No, the answer we found in Job 27 verse 3. It says, and while the ruach is still in me and the spirit of God is still in my nostril. So that thing that you breathe in and out is not a ghost, isn't it? It's the breath of life. When you still find yourself breathing, then you are alive. That is the spirit of God. And when you die, something happens. This goes back to God. God, of course, preserves our identity. And in the resurrection, your identity is restored, but God makes a new body. But whatever goes back to God is not a thinking, conscious entity. No, it is the breath of life that God gave. So the soul or the spirit cannot live in a conscious state apart from the body. When the body dies, the soul ceases to exist. Did you hear what I said? The soul exists when there is body plus ruach. Is that correct? When you dismember any of them, the soul ceases to exist. So when you go to funerals, never say, may his soul rest in eternal. There's something wrong with that sentence. The soul is not there. That thing is dust. That guy is going back to there. The ruah is gone. The soul has, so, has, has ceased. I wanted to look for the past tense of cease. The teacher who asked... Uh, Oh no, this guy, the guy who went to an interview panel and he was asked, he was reporting by the way that by the way, those guys caught me off guard. They asked me, what's the past tense of think? And he was reporting. He said, I thought, I thought, then I said, thank. 
So I was also looking for <laughs> the past tense of seas. Hey, is it source? <laughs> the soul ceases to exist. Does it make sense? Well, friends, if that makes sense out there, would you say amen? When you go to a funeral and somebody is dead and God feels the pain, there is no soul. The souls that are existing is the soul of the pastor preaching, the soul of the people left. The one who is dead is no longer a living soul. For death is the antithesis. Again, I like looking bright with that word. Antithesis of life. The changing or the reversal of life. What was life? Dust plus ruah. When then man, the word is, became. You're not answering for me. Dust plus ruah, man, became. At death, ruah goes where? Returns. Dust returns. The soul goes where? Whoosh, ceases to exist. I hope you remember that as we go along. So now you see, with that background, you now understand what happens. At creation, dust plus breath of life equals what? Living soul. Death. Uh -huh. Death, what happens? Dust minus spirit. Then everybody returns. What happens to the soul? It ceases to exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't. So where was Adam before God created him? He did not exist. Nowhere. Nowhere. When God created him, dust plus breath. Then Adam became living soul. Here is the equation of life. Soul equals to the life of a living being. The person seated next to you is the soul. Say amen. Does it make sense? Even in the Bible, you find this several places in Re uh, Revelation 16.3, even animals have souls because they are living. Yes, when they are alive. That simply means they have the breath of life. You can read that. So dust. I'm making this so clear because this is foundational to what we will learn today. Dust. Can you say that with me? Dust plus spirit equals... What is that dust? It is the elements of the earth plus the breath. That becomes what? A living soul. Question number seven. The Bible makes it plain that King David is saved. How many of you believe that King David is saved? Yes, King David was a good man. The Bible actually calls him the man after God's own. He was a good man. Is he in heaven right now? Is that a good question to ask? Is he in heaven? Is King David in heaven? Let's see. Answer. Acts 2 verse 29. The Bible says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch who? David. That he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher or his sepulchre depending on where you are or his tomb his grave is with us today in fact in verse 34 this is still reading from acts it says for david is not why did the Bible preserve that record? It knew that some people will come and add in some information which is not true. It's, but the question is, well, some people are now asking, but are there people in heaven? Yes, there are some people in heaven. One of them is called Enoch. You know that? You find that in Genesis 5.24 and Hebrews 11.5. He was such a righteous man that he walked until he reached heaven. Of course, God took him. That's what the Bible says. People like thinking there's a little trick question. Some people like asking, who is the oldest man who ever lived? You know, when Enoch had, go, had born Methuselah, and Methuselah lived 969. Very long, isn't it? And then when Enoch had born Methuselah, he walked with God until he was no more. And Hebrews confirms where he is. But the question is, who is the oldest man who ever lived? Some people think it's Methuselah. No, Methuselah is the oldest man who ever died. The oldest man who ever lived is Enoch. Well, of course also, uh, this guy is called Elijah, the Tishbite. He was also taken by a chariot of fire. He is in heaven. So not everybody is in heaven. You read that in 2 Kings. And then Moses, the guy Moses. Yeah, you read that in Romans 5.14 and Jude 1.9, that he is in heaven. He is in heaven. You see him coming in the transfiguration. You read about Moses and Elijah. And there are also some people who were resurrected when Jesus died. 
and they are in heaven. You read that in Matthew 27, 52, and 53. The graves were opened, and not all bodies. How many? Many bodies. So not everybody resurrected at that, at that point. This was localized. It was called special resurrection, which Jesus went with to heaven as the first fruit. Then some people are now asking this evening, Ah, preacher, if you say people don't go to heaven, what about... I know the question in your mind. What question is that? The thief on the cross. Didn't Jesus tell him he would go to heaven that day he died? Well, the only problem we have is we don't read the passage. Let's read the passage. We find that in Luke 23. It says, and he, that is Jesus, oh no, he, that is the thief, said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come with your kingdom. And Jesus responded this way. Jesus said unto him, verily, I say unto you, today thou shalt be with me in and you say, preacher, how do you explain that? It seems to contradict what we have studied tonight, that people go to heaven. Well, if Jesus was saying, today thou shalt be with me, the first question or the first thing you need to take note of, Jesus did not even go to heaven that same day. Yeah, yesterday or the other day we learned that on Friday was preparation. On Saturday he was resting in the tomb, Sindio, because of the Sabbath day, and on Sunday he arose. So he was not in heaven on Friday when they were having that discussion. So did Jesus lie? On Sunday morning he met Mary in the garden and we read that. He told Mary something. J uh, Jesus told, uh, said unto her, that is Mary, touch me not for I am not yet ascended to my father. So he was still in, on earth. But I go, but go to my brethren and say to them, I, ask, I ascend to my father, which is your father, to my God, which is your God. So when Jesus was saying, I am not yet ascended to my father, later he had not ascended to the throne of God, which revelation confirms that's where his father is. Well, friends, we know that Jesus, even by Sunday, was not yet ascended. So did he lie? Well, we know Jesus cannot lie. There must be something we need to learn how to do with the scripture. If you realize that 17 texts of the Bible are facing this direction, and you discover one text which is facing the other direction, read the context, you will soon notice that even that text is facing that direction. And all of them, it's called the thread of truth, and I'm going to show you in this uh, Bible text. In the original Bible, there was no punctuation, no comma. These things were had and added 100 years later by translators. They would even actually translate from one Bible uh, to another by just counting the number of letters. So they would write it something like this. Luke 23 would read something like that in the old letters. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, th this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. No comma. That's how it looks like in Hebrew. In, I mean, if you could read Greek, that's if uh, you can look that in the original text. Then later, of course, the scholars separated the word, they added the punctuations, and could be the punctuation here matters. Let's try and put it somewhere and change its position. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, comma, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That means something else. Let's move the comma a little bit. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily I say unto thee today. Today when you see Peter is, uh, de you know, is denying me. When these Pharisees are mocking me. Today when you see me as a dying person, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Which one do you think makes sense in the entire teaching of the Bible about where people go when they die? Well, I let you to decide. I like a little joke that I make with honey. It's a little sentence I wrote. <laughs> it depends on where the comma is. Honey walked on her head, comma. A little higher than usual. See, that's nice. Honey walked on her head, comma. A little higher than. <laughs> Let's change the comma. Honey walked on. Her head higher than. <laughs> a little higher than. It depends on where the comma is. And so we would want to believe that the translators may have moved that text 
uh, where it was intended. Because in the entire Bible, the teaching is that the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Question number eight. But isn't it true that the soul is immortal and only the body dies? Have you heard things like that? Like that thing you said is immortal, whatever it is. Well, let's read Ezekiel says, the soul that sinneth, it shall well, if it dies, it means it's not, immort it's not uh, immortal. It's mortal. Job 4.17. Shall mortal man be more just than God? We see all around the Bible, it says, all souls that sin, they shall die. That man is mortal. The soul will not live on forever and ever. And this is a doctrine of the devil. You'll see it coming out in our topic tomorrow where they have changed what the Bible intended to say and now they have nothing to do with the men who are not righteous. So they have to place them in a place called purgatory or in hell, burning eternally. Well, friends, God did not promise eternal life for those who are not believing. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that he, whosoever believeth, shall have eternal life. That is the first promise. If you don't believe, the prize is death, not eternal life in torment. That will come out tomorrow. Let's read another text. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only has immortality. So in this life, who only has immortality? God. We will give, get immortality. I'm going to talk to you about it when. So this life, mankind is, immort is, is mortal. They will die. Friends, this is an important truth because the first lie, the first question ever in the Bible ever told, the first lie that was ever told was on the subject of death. And you see, God told Eve that if you eat, you shall die. The devil said, no, you shall not surely, you shall be as God. That's what he said. And that's why a lot of us cannot go to the graveyard because those guys are dead, but they are not surely dead. Friends, those people in the grave are surely dead. Just like Adam, is he alive today? He is dead in the day he ate. God said in Genesis 2.17, if you eat, you shall surely die. The devil came and said, no, you shall not surely die. If you eat, you shall not surely die. Please notice that somebody is disagreeing with God here. And so we have to decide who is right. Who lied? Question is who lied? Could you answer me out there? Because if the soul is immortal, then the devil did not lie. But as we see tonight, the soul is immortal and it dies. And so the devil lied. Question number nine, when will the righteous be given immortality? Answer, we shall all be changed in a moment. You know why it is adding in a twinkling of an eye? If you die now, it doesn't matter. For David, who died 3,000 years ago, if the Lord returns like this, the next thing he knows from the time he dies is to do what? is to be awake. You know, friends, there are people who go to sleep when they're after a long days of work. I feel like the night was like a split of a second, isn't it? How much more will it be in death? If you die, the next thing you know is the waking up. That's why Paul says, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The next conscious state you will know when your soul ceases to exist is when the Lord returns. You'll be changing a moment at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. This is my favorite loudest text. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And he, this mortal must put on. Yes, we will put on immortality, but not now at the coming of Jesus. Let nobody cheat you that the soul is, immo is immortal. I mean, uh, that the soul is mortal. For the Lord himself shall descend. Another verse, 4.16, 1 Thessalonians. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And what will happen? And the dead in Christ shall do what? Rise fast. 
Question number 10. How does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? How does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? You know, Jesus talking about Lazarus, he says, our friend Lazarus, he says Lazarus is dead. Later he confirmed, he said Lazarus is dead when the disciples asked him. And also in Matthew 27, this is, these are the words of Jesus. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which... So according to Jesus, when you sleep, even Samuel was writing and said, thou shalt sleep. Well, friends, even in Psalms, many texts, I could do this over and over. And we have many texts that are not in your historicals. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep thou. So all over the Bible, death is considered as sleep. First Thessalonians 4.14 them also which do what? Sleep in Jesus. You know, friends, people think that when Lazarus was dead, he went to heaven. If Lazarus went to heaven, look here. Heaven is a good place, a beautiful place. I can prove to you from the Bible that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were poor. That's why they couldn't go to the hospital. They couldn't afford an ambulance. And life was hard. Mary had to go and play the whole in Magdala. They didn't have money. And then I die and go to heaven. Then I hear somebody calling me, Lazarus, come forth. I would come complaining, Jesus, what are these? Unanirudisha kwa shida. It come forth, Mimi. You know, or suppose Lazarus was a bad boy and he was in hell. He would come and say, thank you God for relieving me from hell. Lazarus had no story to tell because he was not existing. He was dead, asleep. He didn't know what was going on. Because we have mortal bodies, friends, we die. But we can look forward to Jesus coming soon where we will receive what? Immortal bodies and meet our dead loved ones and our friends. Question number 11. Since wizards, now back to the point of wizards. Since wizards, witches and psychics cannot contact the dead. Because the dead know what? And where are they? <laughs> In fact, they are not even there. Because whatever there is dust. After a few hundred years, it's rotten. It's not there. The guy you're like is not there. So who are they contacting? Is that a good question? Answer. We find that from Revelation 16, 14. They are the spirits of devils working miracles. And friends, make no mistake about it. The devil walks and listens to you speak and he can impersonate you. If we learned last time that he will impersonate Jesus, he can impersonate how he goes to Gikomba, buys your clothes, he dresses and shows up like you and talks like you. Friends, when you see such a person showing up, tell them Ushindwe and let us be careful in studying the word of God so that we will not be deceived. Well, a story is told, friends, of um, a missionary in Africa who came with his daughter and the daughter got some tropical disease and died. The heartbroken parents had to bury this child. And when they went back to the United States, two weeks after the funeral, the mother was sitting in the kitchen. And some little girl showed up and lighted up her face and she was coming to the mother. Mommy, I am not dead. I am here. In fact, the child confirmed to the mother that there is no hell. That's what the other thing the child said. I have been in heaven. And the mother was so tempted to go and hug the little child. And the mother remembered, uh-uh. My child was buried, and the dead know nothing. And she rebuked that spirit, and the thing turned into uh, a, nini, uh, a caterpillar. It's a true story. Well, friends, the Bible says, let's read it together. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Question 12. Why does Satan want us to believe that the spirits of the dead are really alive? This is the main question. The Bible says in 24, 24 Matthew, For there shall arise false Christ, false prophet, and shall show what? Great signs and wonders. That, what was the first lie that the devil told? 
You will not surely die. You have an immortal soul. The devil has worked diligently over the time that this life about death be propagated on media. In so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very... Many people today are deceived about the state of the dead. They think that people who are dead are not really dead. Virtually in every culture and religion, they accept immortality of the soul. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the, you know, everybody, they teach these things and it's always being carried over and even today in churches, they print bulletins and they say R.I.P. Rest in peace. Of course, that's the contracted version. The long version is may his soul rest in peace. Nobody's resting. That guy is not there. Never write it on my funeral. If I die, the next thing I show up, my soul will return when Jesus returns. Friends, you know, if all the dead were in heaven, you know, there would be a crisis when Jesus returns. He would have to say, guys, now for my word to be true, go back to your graves so that I can resurrect you. It's a whole mess up on the Bible. Those guys are in their graves. And this is, well, I respectfully want to agree with the fact that death challenges our very comfort and people grieve differently. I can't tell you what to do with your dead. You will feel the pain differently based on how you relate with the person. But me, if I die in America, don't worry bringing that dead thing back here and you are, you know, scratching your dead. The dead know nothing. They don't care where you bury them. Uh -huh, now I've come down your street, you're looking at me like, you are serious. Yes, I'm serious. Why do you take the long voyage you have to take them to? I don't know where. Well, I agree you may not afford the uh, bury your lap here in town and you want everybody to grieve to see he has died as much as is reasonable. Do what allows you to grieve, but there is a great extent of burial and funeral services that are carried not according to God's word. It appears the devil speaks over those enchanted grounds and says they are not surely dead. If she dies, I'm the one to grieve based on how I feel, where I am, and what I think. I will consult the family. If I decide to bury and we are in Australia, I'll come back and I continue crying, it will be painful. But whether I return her back, she doesn't know. Etimara Tumweke facing the north, she doesn't know. Idiot. Doesn't make sense. Gee, the dead has refused. Has refused. The dead know nothing. And this must be spoken loudly over this pulpit because the great tribes that form this church have a twisted version of what the dead is. We need to go back to the Bible. The men from the black islands of Kisi and the Luos, their thoughts about the dead is twisted. Get back to the Bible. Those guys know nothing. Hope you'll watch this on a funeral. Eh? Can play this on a funeral. <laughs> well, friends, Satanists, they believe in pagan doctrines of the immortality of the soul, that the soul cannot die. Amazingly, many Christians also believe that the soul is immortal and cannot die, even though the doctrine is based on the original lie that the devil told in Eden. In fact, some time ago in the Reader's Digest, a secular publication had an interesting article saying there is no death by a famous preacher. If you know his face, you can go and check. Any of you knows the face of that guy? Some of you know his face. This is what he said. You do not, you don't really die at all. It may seem like death, but you really keep on living and know more afterwards than you did before. You know, we feel like the dead know more. So that when they come and tell us, ah, that thing of hell and heaven is not true. God is going to forgive everybody. Those are the devil's mouthpiece. Spirituality says that the dead know more than the living. And that is what the serpent said. But the Bible says, let's read it together, for the living know that they shall die. But the dead know nothing. In this, let's read from uh, Sprague, a, spiritual, a spiritualist, he says, 
In this, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord is in error. Huh? Who lied? Is it the devil or is God? Who lied? Can you answer me? Now you know why this thing is peddled. Every movie, go watch from today to next Friday. Tell me which movie does not show up a concept of spiritualism. It's being driven into our subconscious, and today, that's why I prepared 260 slides for this. I'm almost done with them. Give me a few minutes, we'll be done. This belief or doctrine that the spirits of the dead communicate with the living through the mediums is called spiritualism. And there are things that are associated with it. Today, it's so much in our schools, so much in our culture, new age, astrology, occultism, magic, reincarnation, witchcraft, satanism, ESP, extrasensory perception, that's what they call it. I'll add one more, Harry Potter. And I'm sure every one of you has read it. It is all doctrines of devils. Question number 13. How effective will Satan's use of these evil spirits be in the last days? Will it be effective? Well, there is a news there. People today are being announced for on local newspaper. How to contact your loved ones in heaven. About 70 million Americans said they think it is possible to communicate with the, their dead. But the Bible says... By their sorceries were how many nations deceived? All nations. That's what the Bible says. It confirms in a, a, a Revelation 18 verse 2. Babylon, that system is called Babylon. We have a session, a lesson on Babylon. Don't miss that one. That Babylon, the great is fallen. And it's become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. That all happened. Revelation confirms that devil and Satan, which deceiveth the, well, friends, that lie will be so effective that everybody will believe the lie. Today, very few people can walk through the cemetery. At the end of this lesson, friends, look for a cemetery, pass by, buy some juice, go and get some juice there, because the Bible says the dead know not anything. <laughs> Question number 14. How does God regard these miracles by the evil angels? Don't be deceived by the miracles they are working because the Bible says a man also or woman that is a wizard shall surely be put to? That's what God thinks about these people who speak to the dead. Some shall do what? Depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what God thinks about them. They are doctrines of devils. What else does God say about those who talk with the dead? He says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Let's hear what God is saying about them. The works of the flesh are manifest. They are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, finally, witchcraft, and many more, many more. Why? Because these are the things that will lead people to the lake of fire. Let's hear what God will do to those who talk to the dead. Sorcerers shall have their part in the lake of, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, and this is called the second death. God wants us not to deal with the sorcerers. And let me stretch this a bit. Back in our villages, kuna wale wa mama, eti when they look at you when you are eating sijui cassava, the cassava turns into poison. I told my mother after learning this, there must be no power if I don't take the poison in the cassava itself. Your eyes looking at me, it must be a demon. And I soaked myself in Jesus and I went back to the village and I told mother, mom, kuna hao wachawi kwa hii village? Akasema, wewe, wewe utarogwa. Nikambia, waite wakuje. And the mother, the woman who is known to be a mchawi came. And I was feeling righteous. I started eating. And I told Jesus, can you defeat the demons in sight and confirm that you are God? And I ate. And the mother looked at me and they thought I was going to die. I am here to confirm that demons are not stronger than, the, than God. 
Many people will listen to the devil's first lie that you will not surely die, and they'll become deceived by this masterful deception. But we don't have to fall into the devil's temptation and deception if we believe what the Bible teaches. Do you believe the Bible out there? You believe the Bible. The Bible teaches that death is a quiet rest. You know why this subject is important? Come with me in your mind's eye to a home where there was this loving mother and you know, and this mother was the one who was providing for little kids who have not understood what death is. And soon the mother gets sick, not even sick, let's just say she went out to work, she promised the kids some goodies in the evening and by bad luck, God forbid, this mother dies in an accident. And the little kids are asking daddy, where is mom? Why doesn't mom come back? And daddy is crying and sobbing uncontrollably. And one day, people come to the, their home. And as they come, they come with some wooden thing. And the mother is lying there smiling as if she, she is sleeping. And of course, the pastor is also there. And the, the preacher, you know, is, is standing to, you know, to, to preach. And he tells these little ones that God has taken your mother, he's in heaven smiling. Think about what the little kids are thinking about God. And then from there, the little kids are taken by, let's say the man gets married to a bad woman. Let's see, I'm just making up this story. For you to understand why this lie is not against you, it's against God. The man marries a woman who now, you know, puts these little children into slavery and they are having a hard time. And they can just imagine God took their mother in heaven and their mother is watching and they are, you know, one at a second. Do you think these children will ever love God? Suppose the preacher stood and said the truth and said, friends, your mother has slept the sleep of death. And in this sleep of death, you don't know anything. You don't return to speak. You can't do everything you used to do. You can't praise God. But Jesus, when he comes back, he has the keys to the grave and he will return your mother. What do you think those children will think about Jesus? They look forward to Jesus, isn't it? And so go out there and say the truth about death, that death is sleep. Incidentally, even if that mother would be in heaven looking and all, his child, all her children are going through difficult times, would, would she be happy in heaven? No, she wouldn't. She would mar the happiness of heaven. Nobody is in heaven looking at how we are going through life difficultly. You know, friends, when the new note came, I have one. I think I want to show one here. When the new note came out, uh, this, this the bankers know. The bankers know that when you're being trained to know the truth, the true note, they are not shown many of the false notes, isn't it? They are shown the actual note. This is the actual note. Small, it has a groove here. They are taught to know how it looks like and how it, res how it sounds with respect to others. Do like this. I think you, you need to learn that by now. This is the time that you will be cheated with the notes which are not true. You do something like this, a fake note, it in Meraroka, just do that. This thing nowadays they can photocopy. That's how bankers are trained. They are trained to, they study the original for a long time. When they see the counterfeit, they can always tell it. And that is true with the word of God. When you know the original, you will know the truth. When you see the counterfeit, you will say, ah, ah, it's not the truth, isn't it? So soak yourself. They have given you many Bible texts ever than any other study. And I want to add still a few or I can stop here. I think I've told you so much. Do you want to know about angels? Are angels spirits of our dead friends? No. Angels are not spirits of our departed loved ones. Angels existed way before human beings existed. 
Do angels ever appear to human beings? The answer is yes. You need to know. How do they appear? Do they ever appear in the form of our departed loved ones? The answer is no. Here is how angels appear. Number one, they either appear as an angel where when they step on the ground like this, there is an earthquake. And they are shining in bright light and you will be feeling afraid. That's how they appear to Zechariah. Secondly, they can appear as a stranger, not as a person you know. Now you know. Hebrews says, let us not be forgetful of entertaining strangers. For some did what? Entertain the angels. If an angel appears to you, this is the test. Even if he's a stranger and he has a lot of miracles, it's another test. To the law and to the testimony. Write this down. Galatians 1.8. If an angel shows up, a stranger, I know the devil is listening to this sermon and he's going to craft the last bit. He's going to show up as a stranger and he's going to show up with angelic power in your house. And he will show up bright light and say, it is no longer required of you to keep the Sabbath. Remember, Ezekiel 20 verse 8. To the law and to the testimony and tell that angel, get thee behind me, Satan. For an angel will never contradict God. They are messengers of God. So communicating with the evil spirit is opening the devil's door. Let me read from a book called The Great Controversy. I want to end in a nice way today. Page 560. It says, many will be confronted by the spirits of devils, personating loved ones or loved relatives and friends, declaring the most dangerous heresies. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. What must we do? We must be prepared to withstand them with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything and that they who thus appear are the spirits of demons. Tell them, get thee behind me because the living know that they shall die. Finish it. But... Friends, I have spoken from the bottom of my heart at the top of my voice. This is the last question I want you to answer. What glorious power does God offer his people? He says that you may know him, that I may know him too. The power, and know what? The power of his resurrection. You need some assurance tonight. An extra question, not on your historical, I don't know if it's there. No, it's not there. You can be answering your response. Do I need to be afraid of spirits? No. Some says, when I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I will put my trust in God. I will have no fear. What can flesh or even spirits do to me? Psalms 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fears him, and he delivers them. You know the Bible says that the, the devil went down with a third of the angels. Guess what? Two thirds were left in heaven. And for every one demon, there are two good angels. One in front, one at the back. You need not to fear. Perfect love casts off fear. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Though the devil and his demons are powerful, we don't need to be afraid of them. God gives us many promises in his word that helps us not to be afraid. One day, in a rocky flight, people were so afraid when the air aircraft went up and down. And they saw that this was not a good flight. They felt the roar of thunder above the engine of this Boeing. And it was moving up and down, and they felt we are almost crashing. And people were shouting, people making their last prayer, then they looked at the side and they saw a little girl quietly resting, very happy, reading the news. And they were angry with the girl. They said, why are you not stressed and we are in trouble? The girl said, well, you guys, what's wrong with you? My father is the pilot. He cannot harm us. All will be well. Yes, friends, when God is on our side, we don't need to fear anything. I would like you to go to the historical and answer the question at the back. That will be our call for tonight. Recognizing that God is in full control of earthly events 
Are you willing to let him control your life? What's your answer? That's why there is hope for you. Death, the dead are resting in their grave. There is hope for you. No thoughts of memory can they save. There is hope for you. Emotions too, they do not rave. But there is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you. Death is only just asleep. There is hope for you. Jesus, will your record keep? There is hope for you. You really don't have to weep because there is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you. Christ will return in the skies. There is hope for you. The dead in Christ will then arise. There is hope for you. Tears will not then dim our eyes. Because there is hope in Christ for you. Let's stand as we pray. Asking God that he will sustain us even beyond death. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because truth comes from you. Truth liberates us, prevents us from being deceived, and leads us to follow you who is the way, the truth, and the life. I ask, O oh Lord, that from the things we have learned in this study, we will be preserved from the wiles of the enemy and the schemes of the cults and the devil that seeks to steal us when we don't know your word. We ask that you will bring these words in our minds and in our hearts as we deal with the things of this earth which are calculated to deceive even the very elect. Keep us safe as we go home and bless us now for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go safe and remember that the living know that they will die, but the dead know how much?